All right, so we're going to take a little um, detour off my uh, standard uh, lessons for this class. Um, we're going to talk about, I mean, networking is something that we're talking about, right? That's what the whole freaking class is about. But before we dive into the world of industrial networking, I want to dive into the world of home networking. All right, so before I even do anything else, what networking equipment do you guys know of that you have at home? Okay, got a router. What else? Anybody? Modem? Anything else? It could. I'll, I'll, I'll put it up there. We'll, we'll talk about it. We'll continue. All right. Anything else? Danielle, we're talking about um, home networking equipment. So I'm just trying to get, see what, what equipment you guys think you have at home. So we've got router, modem, and satellite dish. I don't know if you have any other uh, thoughts that you've got at home. And about some other equipment. All right. All right, so not a bad starting place. Now, satellite dish, that is... I'm going to call it dependent on your circumstances, right? If you are using Elon Musk's Starlink satellite, Star, Starlink, whatever it's called, um, you know, then yes, you're going to have a satellite dish on your roof because that's how you're getting your internet. There are also other internet service providers that are providing internet to your house via a satellite dish, right? Um, I would say traditionally that's for rural applications where there's the, like I, the internet service providers, right? ISP, internet service provider, if you didn't know that one. Um, so if the ISP doesn't want to run cables to your house, they're like, I'm a farm that's on 300 acres. And they're like, yeah, we're not running a cable to your house. So if you want us to, you're going to have to pay for it. And you're like, that's two grand up front. I don't think I really want to do that. All right. Then satellites normally like where that option would be, or maybe even cellular. You could use a cellular modem at your house to get yourself internet. So satellite dish. Yes, they are out there. Um, they are great for certain circumstances, <laughs> especially like RV living, not a bad option, especially against Starlink. Um, but there's not a whole lot of them out there. And Starlink, I think, is like above and beyond what the standard internet service provider does for um, satellite-based internet. I think its speeds are much higher. I think you're getting like 30, 40 megs a second, where with standard, I think it's like 10, if you're lucky. And uploads are even worse. Like, absolutely horrific. So Starlink definitely took internet service, or satellite internet, to like a whole new level, as far as I'm concerned. Um, but anyway, so satellite dish, yes. Modem, again, possibly you're going to have one. If you guys have Antietam cable, any, how many guys have Antietam cable in here? Two of you, all right? Do you, do you either of you guys know what you have or have no clue? No clue? No clue? Okay. Um, but anyway, if you have um, Antietam, that is a cable provider who has, they've altered their cable, their coax that they've run all found on all the telephone poles to work with internet as well. Um, then yes, you are going to have a modem, all right? Now, if you are running something like fiber optics at your home, which we have point broadband that is in the area now, not very well coveraged. Um, they're covering my house, and I'm probably going to be switching to them soon. Um, but they are an option out there. So um, you could do fiber optics. Then you're not doing a modem. The whole point of a modem is to convert analog to digital. All right? So with coax, we're converting radio frequencies, or you know, frequencies getting sent through the coax cable. That's analog signals. With fiber optic, we're dealing with pulsing lights. That's digital. All right. So modem, not. But anyway, everybody, if you have internet at home, you are connected to the lovely world of the cloud. All right. I'm just going to call this the cloud, or maybe you want to call it the internet. All right. And you are connected to that through your ISP, your internet service provider. All right. Um, in this case, we're just going to assume that you're using a, uh, a modem because that's what most people have going to their house at this point is um, using cable modems, what type of thing. So you're going to have a modem. All right, and you've got your modem. So coming into this, you've got your coax, your standard TV coax with your RG6 connector on. All right, and what comes out of that modem? Anyone know? So the plug goes from your modem to something else? Nothing? Ethernet. All right, that is going to be your standard Ethernet connection. All right, um, so we've got, I don't want to label, 
So with C for coax and E for ethernet. Probably change colors, but... All right, and then from your, your modem, we go into your router. Now, most of you, if you haven't done model networking, but I've got a router, that's all my network equipment. And I would partially agree. All right. For the most part, yes. This is how things are advertised, right? If you're like, okay, let me go ahead and go to Best Buy. All right, and you're like, Best Buy, router. There we go. Boom. You know, it's, it's a router. Oh, it says wireless router, but it's a router. That's what you go. If you go to you know, Best Buy and say, hey, I need to get you know, connected to my internet, my, my route, my, and you have a modem coming into my ISP, what do I need? They're going to go, here, you need a wireless router. All right. And... Well, technically that is correct, all right? That is not the best option to answer, all right? The whole point of a router is to direct traffic places, all right? So on your router, if we think about a normal router, especially if we look at like the back of a normal router, you're gonna A, have your, your Wi-Fi antennas, right? So you've got one over here maybe, and then maybe another one over here. And depending on how crazy your router is, you could have like six or 12 or, you know, however many freaking antennas they put on these things nowadays. If you go with the really high end ones, all right? Um, you could go with the, I'm gonna call it the lower end ones, all right? And you might have no antennas sticking off the back of it because they're all internal, all right? Um, it really doesn't matter in that instance, but you're gonna have, probably have some sort of antennas for wireless coverage. You also, on the back of this, you'll have one port. It traditionally is yellow. All right, and that's purely yellow to help make your life easier when you're trying to set this up. And that's what would connect to your modem. All right, and it's normally labeled internet. And then next to that one port, you're gonna have four more ports. All right, and these will be labeled as LAN. All right, and that will be your local area. Right. Um, if this one is not labeled internet, it's gonna be labeled WAN, which is the wide area now. So again, that one goes out to the wider area. Um, so this router that you all probably know have in your house, and you could probably picture where it is, and like when the internet doesn't work, what do you do? You unplug and plug, right? Just plug it and unplug it. All right, I took that so far, I put a freaking light switch on my outlet. Yep. Um, yeah, when we, we bought our house, uh, we renovated the bathroom right behind my, my laundry room, and I ran a conduit up to the laundry. So this is where I'm putting all my internet stuff, right here. Is like centrally located on the house as it can be. And I put a freaking light switch in on the outlet that goes to it. So that way when the internet goes down, because I have it up really high, my wife can just turn the light switch off and turn the light switch back on. Um, and she thought I was nuts for doing that. And after about two or three months, she's like, that was perfect. <laughs> Thank you. But anyway, um, as part of this router, it's actually three different devices. So you have your router, and that is for... Um, directing traffic. Directing traffic. All right. Then you also have inside that a switch. And this allows you to connect multiple devices to the router. All right. And that is really what the LAN ports are here. These are all just a switch. All right. Um, you, it could technically be what's called a hub. Um, a hub is a dumb switch, all right? So a hub, anytime it receives traffic in one port, it just rebroadcasts it out all the other ones, all right? That's kind of like me saying, hey, Chris, do this. And you're like, all right, I got it. And you just yell it to everybody, <laughs> all right? Instead of me saying, hey, Chris, call so-and-so, and you're like, okay, let me dial that one number. Like just dial, you know, getting a megaphone out versus a phone to something. All right. So Hub just broadcasts it. Um, do they work? Yes. In low traffic environments, is it a problem? No. All right. When you start getting to high traffic environments where you have one device that has a lot of traffic going to it or from it or whatever the case is, then that thing's rebroadcasting a lot of information to a lot of places that it doesn't need to go. And that starts causing congestion, All right? So we, for the most part, as a society, I'm going to say, moved away from hubs. Can you buy an Ethernet hub still? Oh, I'm sure you can. Let's uh, just go ahead and, and look up some shopping for Ethernet hubs. There you go. Oh, this, I'll, even these are saying switch, switch, switch. 
up oh, here's a hub that one's used though all right um so for the most part people are calling all right we're going to switch anymore there's a hub for 10 bucks but it's probably also used all right so you look at those ethernet hubs and you look at an ethernet switch if i can spell it would probably be better but there we go and they look exactly the same there's no real difference from a switch to a hub all right a switch though is smart it says, oh, you're trying to send traffic to so-and-so, and it knows that's down this port. So it only sends that traffic out that port um, instead of rebroadcasting it to everybody. So when possible, um, it's nice to buy a switch. If you have the capabilities, I'll put a switch in instead of a hub. Now, again, your router, your combo wireless router combo unit has a switch built into it, right? Um, but if you need more ports, you got to put another switch on it. Um, so... Your wireless router has a router, it has a switch, and then on top of that, red back out again, it has an AP or an access point. Right? And that is what handles everything wireless. All right. So that little one all in one device that you buy, it, it's great. It gets the job done, right? You all are probably using them, no major issues. There's a nice little web GUI for you to go and monitor and tweak things and do all this other fun stuff, and it gets the job done. That's really what matters. Now, you could probably, if we would actually like look up specs on those things, your cell phone has more processing power <laughs> than those routers do. All right. And again, for home use, perfectly fine. You know, you're like, okay, I've got me, two brothers, going back to my family, I've got you know, me, two brothers, my mom, and my dad. All right, there's five of us in the house. We all have a cell phone with Wi-Fi. That's five devices. We all we all had tablets. That'd be two devices at ten. And then there's like a master computer or two for us in the house. You know, it's like okay, we got like less than twenty devices. Not a big deal. You come into an environment like a company, and it's like okay, you all just show up. Now there's only four of you in here, so it's not a big deal. But if you go down the hall to the accounting classes where they've got twenty or thirty students in there and they all have cell phones on them, it's like well, there's sixty devices. <laughs> And then there's also a laptop cart, and that's another 20 devices. So you're now up to 80. And there's, you know, all of a sudden you go from a like simple at home network of like 20 devices or so to a, a company where you're like, oh, there's 2,000 devices on the network, right? <laughs> that little home router switch ain't going to cut it. Right? So we move up to dedicated devices. All right. Um, so router switch and access point. So in here, as I've pointed out to you guys before, we have access points. All right, and for the most part, there is nothing super fancy about access points. Um, here is, this is not the one I use, but this is the company I use. Um, it is the Unify UAP AC Pro. All right, little circular disc about it, nothing too crazy going on, but the whole purpose of this one device is to take wireless traffic and convert it to Ethernet. That's the whole purpose of this singular device here. All right. Where if you look at your old, you know, your all-in-one router at home, it's like, okay, I got to take all these devices, I got to fit them into Ethernet, then I have to take that traffic, determine where it's going, and spit that out back out the right port, and it starts to get kind of confusing. Right? So it starts to become a little more, bit more and more and more complex. So when it's possible, I do like to actually separate these. Now the other thing that you can do is as I said, you have your router here and you've got four LAN ports. Now, how many of you guys have anything Ethernet connected in your house using Ethernet? One person? How many devices? Uh, two or three. All right. In my house, coming off the Ethernet ports, I've got an access point on one on my router, and then I have one Ethernet cable that goes down to my office. In my office, what I actually did is I have another switch down there. Get the five quarter, but doesn't really matter. All right, so I have one cable that actually goes, you know, from here, from this port to there, and then this one goes to my desktop, and then this one goes to my server, and then this one is a bonus, another cable I just have to, sitting on my desk. So if I have a laptop or something to plug in, it's already there and waiting for me. And I think there might be one or two more devices down there that. So I've got a lot of stuff wired with Ethernet, and I actually want more. Um, my dad and I were putting insulation in our attic. We are just putting more in to help keep the heat out and whatnot. Um, we actually ran an Ethernet cable all the way from my basement all the way up to my attic. 
goes from my office, through the basement, through the garage, up into a dip one attic, and through a little hole up into another attic. <laughs> All right, now, you may be going, why did you do that? Future proofing. All right, I don't have a need for an ethernet cable in my attic right now, but maybe in the future, I will, and right now I already have it run. So I don't have to go fight to get that cable up there the next time. I can just go, oh, it's sitting right here, and I can just put a connector on it, plug something in, I'm good, or I can cut it somewhere else and you know, use half the wire or whatever the case. I was just trying to future-proof myself. Um, but plugging things with Ethernet, if you can do it, it will save yourself so much complications. It's like, oh, the Wi-Fi, you know, the Internet's so slow today, and it's like you move 10 feet with your laptop, and you're like, oh, never mind, it's fine. It's like, yeah, it was just where your laptop was. Um, or except for me, my living room TV, or my family room TV, has in Internet issues. I don't know why. It's not that far, but it has Wi-Fi issues. So I really want to get Ethernet cable to it, but I can't. There's no good way to get the cable either from the basement up or from the roof down. Can't do it. Um, so I haven't done that yet. That is me. One of these days. Um, but anyway, so switches, yeah. So you could add switches on. And you could put more and more and more and more. Now, I mean, the standard Ethernet, if you buy a computer with an Ethernet port on it, most likely, it now currently has the capability of one gigabit per second. All right, the thousand, thousand meg, but we're advertising. Most devices are at that point nowadays. Do we need a thousand meg? Oh no. All right, there is in an average home network situation, there is no need for you to have a thousand meg connection. All right, especially if you don't have a server. Do you have a server? Maybe. Because if you're like, I have a server with my media running on it, and I've got all these wire, you know, devices that are trying to pull, in, pull videos off of it at the same time. Okay, if you've got three devices and you're all pulling 100 meg inter, you know, connections off of that, now you're at 300 meg. All right, maybe at that point, yes, you need a, a gigabit network. But for the average person, no, there is no need to have a gigabit network. All right. Um, I'd say like a 50 meg connection would be plenty fast enough to stream YouTube videos and Netflix. And maybe when you start getting to 4K, um, maybe then you start needing it. And it's, let's just see. That means 24 megabits per second is what the internet comes. So one gig, way overkill. All right. However, the one point where I do see you needing that like major network connection, that one gig, is when you do have either dedicated access points or a, said like a server run or something, where you might have multiple devices sending lots of traffic on a single run. So for me, that would be this run right here. Because as you can see, I've got my desktop sitting on this, I've got my server sitting on this, I might have another laptop or something. Those are all sharing this one ethernet cable going back to my network. So in that instance, having that higher network speed is actually very important. Because now they all share that bandwidth of them all having a dedicated channel. So a little bit of give and take going on in that aspect. Now, moving on from this point, um, going to like a more industrial network. All right, if we go to, to HCC, I had a map of HCC up at some point. There we go, let's pull this over. All right, so we are sitting over here where it says Hyrock. All right, if we look at campus, We've got an admin IT building. We've got LSC. We've got the student center. We've got Kepler. We've got the LSC. We've got the um, VSH. We've got STEM. You've got the ARC. You got the Energy House. You've got um, CPB. You know, I missed that one. You've got another building over here. This is our facilities building. There are a lot of different buildings on campus that we are taking in and sending in a um, So again, we got to have more powerful hardware. So this is when we start getting into um, the wonderful world of separating all these devices out. This patch panels. Yeah, that's I don't really want to, I don't want the full video, I just want this picture. All right, so over here, you can see a little example of a network rack, all right? Um, here we've got a lot of patch panels and things like that, but like right down here, these actually look like fiber optic cables to me. You can really see the color. 
Those look like fiber optics to me. Not positive they are. Um, this is a switch, switch. I'm not seeing a router in this instance, but a lot's going on in network rec. I really wish I had access to like the one right down the hall. I could just take you guys and walk you in. Uh, if you're ever in ATC and you're up on the top of the second floor, um, 201, there is a network rack in there, um, in the actual classroom. Most annoying thing in the world I'm teaching there because you have these fans just constantly going. But it's there, it's just kind of in the open so you can actually go see it and kind of take a look at it if you're bored and see what an actual network rack looks like. And uh, it looks like a mess, I'm gonna tell you right now. All right. So anyway, we're gonna have dedicated network devices or dedicated routers. And the whole point of a router is to route information from one building to the next, all right? A router will often convert one media type to another as well. So you might have an ethernet port on the router going to a fiber optic port or something like that. Um, or multiple ethernet ports may be coming in and one fiber optic port going out or multiple fiber optic ports, you know, whatever the case is. However, we're getting information to and from that building. So if we were to look at standard place that has multiple internet connections so you've got your isp whatever that is most likely if you're at a business it's going to probably be fiber optic of some sort but that's going to come in to your main router actually it's probably going to go to a firewall first a dedicated firewall you all have firewalls at your house yes all right it is built into your router all right so it's there May not be a big deal, but it is, it is technically, a, there is technically a firewall there. So anyway, you're going to go to your firewall, probably go to a dedicated firewall first, and then that's going to go to your main router. All right. And that router, if you say you have four different buildings, will probably have a network cable, you know, a fiber optic line that goes to each building. And each of those will have a router in it. Now, depending on how big your building is and everything else, that main router in each building may then subdivide that again to multiple other routers. All right. So examples in this building, there are three different floors. You could have the main router then send traffic to a different color. And this would be, you know, floor one, floor two, and floor three, each one of those floors has its own router. That's then sending, taking that main line and then again dividing it out to us. Right. So you maybe you say you've got a 10 gig internet connection here. You got a 10 gig connection between your firewall and your router because well, if you have a 10 gig coming in, you might as well have all that capability go from the router to the firewall. Otherwise, you're paying for overkill. And then maybe each of these is you know four gig. Actually, let's go with five gig. Five gig is actually. All right, so you got five gig coming off of that. And maybe you keep it five gig until you get to that, the, each floor, whatever the case. Is there a good reason to run 10 gig from your main router to your sub buildings? Maybe, you know, depending on your work environment, if you're like, well, you know, we have a night crew in this one building, maybe they should have a, whole, a 10 gig link because it's like, okay, we're gonna be sending all that traffic to them. And then each of those routers is gonna to go to multiple switches. And that was kind of what I was trying to show you guys in this picture. Oh, no what I was, but um, I said that this device right here, that is definitely a switch. I like how they've actually color coded all this. There's probably another switch right here that we can't see very well, right? That's probably a switch. All right, and they've actually then taken this and they wire these out to what's called patch panels. I do actually have a patch panel in here, but I don't see it right this moment. Um, the whole point of a patch panel is for organization and cleanliness is all it comes down to, all right? In your home use, you probably are like, yep, okay, we're gonna run an ethernet cable. Let's just to say, you wanna run an ethernet cable from your home router to your TV or your gaming computer or whatever. You're probably like, all right, maybe run a cable into the wall, you know, down through all the walls, wherever it's going, comes out a different wall and good, you just take that same cable that you've got connected directly to the router and plug it into your computer. So you just have a random wire coming out of the wall. Well, that's fine. Um, could you imagine having like, a hundred different wires just hanging out a wall in a network palace and having to troubleshoot what the hell's going on in there. Yeah, that would be a bad, bad day. All right. So a patch panel allows us to hook up all those random wires that go to all these random locations to this very nice dedicated spot 
So that way we can keep everything kind of neat and organized. All right, so here is an example of a little patch panel. This is only a 12 porter. All right, so we've got six ports on the left. If I slide over, we got six more ports. But you can see how on the back, we run wires into this um, with what's called a punch down tool. And so it actually does, takes the wires directly from the sheathing and shoves them into these little slots that have little like V contacts in them. So you push the wire and it cuts the insulation and actually like cuts into the wire a little bit to make a really good connection. Um, and that allows us to have a nice little ethernet port hanging out the front where we can then put a label. So you could say, this is ATC 213, you know, computer one or, you know, whatever the case is. That way you can start organizing your cabinets. Because let me tell you, um, you start looking at some of these cabinets, even like, uh, I don't, I don't work. This one actually is a really good, um, picture. Like everything there looks nice and neat, right? Um, we actually look at all of these Ethernet cables, and actually none of them are, um, but we, where they actually run the Ethernet cables into little like dust covers. So they have a cable that comes out of here, goes into this dust cover, maybe it runs up or down or whatever, and then it pops out you know, here and connects to that port. All right? A, tracing that wire is gonna suck. Because it's now hidden. So it's like, okay, where does this wire go? Does it make the cabinet look really clean and organized? Oh yeah, that's really nice. Right. But trying to like follow that wire when it's something so like something's wrong with this wire. Which which port does it go into? So unless you have a really good like crawling or something, that's gonna suck. Normally, um, if you look at network cabinets, um, they do something maybe more like this. Hold on, I gotta find it. That's the one I want. All right, so you can see they come out, these patch panels, and they all just kind of get grouped together and go over the side. So at least you have a chance of following that cable. All right, when it goes to the back of your network pack cabinet, you are just up a freaking cliff. Now, I was looking for a, a bad example here. Oh man, these are, these are really bad examples. That one won't work. There we go. There's a bad example for you. Anyone want to troubleshoot that one? Because I can tell you, I sure as hell don't want to. All right. So those wires, they just go everywhere. It seems like the color coding, though know, there is no color coding. It was just whatever they felt like doing. Um, it's like, oh, I have a yeah, yeah, random yellow cable around or whatever the case is. So um, you can keep your network cabinets really nice and clean. And at the same point, they can be an absolute freaking mess. All right, um, so network cabinets, they're going to be really important. Um, and setting everything up and having nice control over things and all that wonderful stuff is also going to be important for you to be able to actually control your network. Now, for our home networks, most of those wireless routers that you pick up, those all-in-ones, any of you guys ever go in and change any of the configurations on them? I hope and pray you've changed at least one password. All right, you probably have changed two or three things. You probably changed the wireless name. You've hopefully given the wireless a password and hopefully you changed the password to the router. So fun little uh, side note here, why it's important to change your wire router password. Right? So I moved up to Indiana after uh, college to go to grad school. And I moved into this, to, to this house with two or three other guys, two other guys. Um, and it was like, okay, all well and good. Got there, I was moving in. Um, the other guys were working at that point, you know, no big deal. Like, man, I really like to listen to some music. I don't have internet right now. I don't have the Wi-Fi password. <laughs> um, so I was like, okay, let's, let's see if I can get around this. So I went downstairs with my laptop, and I plugged my laptop directly into the router. Um, and I hit internet. I'm not really surprised. I bet the same thing would happen at your guys' house. I'd just go to your house, plug my laptop in, bet I would have internet right away. All right? Um, same thing in my house. You plug into my network at home, you're going to get internet. Like flaw on my plan, but just got to deal with it. Um, so I was like, okay, cool, I have internet now. Like, but I really want the Wi-Fi. So I was like, okay, what's my IP address? I looked at my IP address using command prompt. Like, okay, the router's IP is this. I typed that in my web browser. Like, okay, you know, pulls up a login page. I looked at the router, did a quick Google. I'm like, you know, model WRT54G default password. It's like, username. Admin, password, password. All right, let's try it. Work like a freaking champ. 
Like, okay, go to the wireless configuration tab. Oh, the wireless name is this. Okay, type that into my laptop. Oh, the wireless password is this. Type that in my password. <laughs> Boom, I'm now on the Wi-Fi. No one was home, you know, they, they would have no clue that I would now have their wireless username and passwords, right? And maybe, depending on how uh, not a, a bad person I am, you can now start hacking their wire, their network. You could put, you know, depending on the routers and whatnot, you could add tracking or something. So by getting a little control over stuff, you can do a lot of things with your network, right? So you wanna make sure you always change the default passwords. Um, so that way, even if someone does bad because come to your network and they reset your router, you at least know because the passwords are all different. You're like, okay, something happened. Let me reset it again. Go back to my configuration. So you really do want to make sure that you, um, yeah, change your default passwords. Never good to keep. Um, sometimes they're just written on the bottom of the router. It's like, oh, the, wire, the wireless password is, you know, Linksys 54286. Password is elephant, giraffe, donkey. That's actually kind of like some defaults now. Wireless companies will be like, okay, we're going to pick three random words or three random animals, put those together in a password for which is better than the password just being password. Like at least it's default to your to your router. But when you flip the router open, there's the password. It kind of the whole point. Someone has access to. Oh, I do highly suggest that you guys go through and change this. So, but the default stuff just works fine, right? Now there's a lot of things you can do. Um, for example, at my house, I have what's called VLANs, virtual local area network setup. Right. So I also have three different wireless names being broadcast at my house, right? You sign on to the one and it's full access to everything. Internet, everything on the network, whatever. You sign on to my home automation one, no internet access. Access to my entire network, but no off internet. And that's because like if I put a, a, a security camera on that you know I bought for 20 bucks, I don't need it phoning back to China, <laughs> right? Like, okay. Yeah, I'll hook you up, get you all on the network, Wi-Fi, everything will be well and good, and then I'll say, no more internet for you. <laughs> so I just block internet from that, anything on that network. Uh, for two purposes. One, it helps protect my home automation devices from being hacked, because they're not able to access the internet. And two, it protects them from phoning home, because they can access it. And then I do have a third one for guests, if I really don't trust my guests, I can go, yeah, you can have this one, and all they have is internet. I have three different Wi-Fis set up. I have not used my guest network. That was a more recent setup, so I just haven't gotten around to giving that to you. But, so you can do things like that, multiple wireless. And most home wireless routers will have a guest network out. So you can set up a guest. You may go, yeah, okay, anyone can access guest. I don't need a password for it because it can't access anything on my network. I don't care. They're just using my internet access. Which maybe you're friendly with your neighbors and you're like, yeah, go ahead, jump on the guest, everything's fine. If you're not friendly with your neighbors and you're like, screw you, no guest password, or guest password. <laughs> Now you can't get on my network, all right? So a lot of different things are going to be going on there. Questions so far? So, so far we've talked about just like default standard networking hardware. All right, I haven't shown you a lot of pictures of them, but that's fine. All right, so we're going to now continue onto my lovely little PowerPoint that I actually have set up. All right, talking about TCP IP, all right? Um... And this is on that practical industrial data communication best practice techniques, chapter 7a, it says. So if you want to look it up on that, that ebook that's on D2L. So anyway, the first thing we need to talk about is NICs, right? NIC is a network interface card. There we go. I'm thinking controller, but card. All right. Um, and up on the screen here, I have a whole bunch of different NICs. All right. The first type of NIC you probably have, especially if you have a desktop computer, is an uh, Ethernet, hardwired, right? Um, that NIC could be, yeah, get my pen up. Yeah, that could be, there we go, um, built into your computer. Could be right on the motherboard itself, right? Most likely is that if you have a desktop computer, you have a, a hardwired Ethernet port built onto your computer. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, all like major household appliances that are supposed to be on the network, should have a hardwired port on them. And a great example of this is printers, right? You have a network-based printer, so you don't have to have it plugged in via, to a computer via USB. It should have a hardwired Ethernet on it. My big printer at home, which is a color laser printer that does, you know, scanning and faxing and all those other things, does not have an Ethernet. Only wireless. What are they thinking? It costs them like an extra, like, 30 cents to put an Ethernet port on this thing. 
They're like, no, nah, we're not going to do it. Why not? I want to punch those people in the face. Right. Um, and every once in a while, my printer is like, no, I'm not going to hit connect to Wi Fi. Every other day, you're perfectly fine. Nothing's changed. Printer hasn't moved. Wireless hasn't moved. I'm still sitting in the same chair, and it's like, no, no Wi Fi for you. I restarted, and you know, I turned it off back on. Still no wireless. <laughs> Can't figure it out. I don't know what happens. But anyway, um, so Ethernet, nice wired port. All right. You could have wireless. All right. So obviously, you got your antennas going on here. All right. Um, you could have cellular based. All right. So you could have a, an actual cellular modem basically built into your car, but that's still a network interface card. Um, that could have, again, antennas that hang off your computer or not, depending on the situation. All right. And then the other big thing when we're talking about um, interfaces is PCI versus USB. Anyone has heard those terms before? You've all heard USB, because I said that the other day in class. Hopefully you've heard of USB, but universal serial bus. What is PCI? Peripheral interconnect. Um, peripheral component interconnect. All right. So why does this matter? Well, this matters because of what type of speeds are you expecting with that card that you're connecting to your computer. Um, we are, I'd say we're pretty well into the world of USB 3. All right. Um, if you see the USB port, you know, with the, the blue tongue inside of it, that's a USB 3 port. Right. If you don't have the blue tongue, then um, most likely it's two, but every once in a while, some manufacturers don't follow the standard because they don't want this ugly blue USB tongue on your computer. They're like, fine, we won't put the blue in, we'll make it black. All right. um, but normally they're marked somehow. But if you only had USB 2, you could get a max of 480 megabits per second transfer rate from that device to the computer. All right. So if you're like, I got a gig USB card cable, let me plug that in, it doesn't do you any good. Because all of a sudden now you only get 408 megabits per second max, and now it's probably actually going to be slower because of the whole USB world and all those other fun things. So it's not just carrying Ethernet, it's also carrying some other signaling and whatnot. So it's like, okay, but maybe 400 meg, you know, now I'm going to get the full gigabit. Um, we're now with the world of USB 3 and 3.1, you can see that we're at 4.8 gig or even 10 gigabit possible over USB. That's a huge step up from what USB is. Right? And the other thing is with PCI. So down here in the bottom left is I have PCI. Now these are what I'm going to call standard PCI connectors for a desktop computer. Right? If you have an all-in-one computer or a laptop, you're not going to see those connectors. All-in-one's most likely you won't. I think I've ever seen one with it, but maybe. All right. Um, but there are other PCI connectors out there. So you might see like a, an M.2, right, for a, a new SSD connector. Those are technically, um, some of those are technically PCI, so you might be able to um, network it with that port instead. Um, you also may see a dedicated wireless one that looks like an M.2 slot. That's for laptops. So you can actually remove your wireless card and put a new wireless card in if you want to. Really can. Um, but depending on the version of PCI and the number of lanes. Now, what do I mean by the number of lanes? You don't have any idea? Okay. So down the very bottom here, you can see we have a PCI, and this does say times 1. And up here, we have a times 16. All right. So it's basically how many wires or pairs of wires. I'm not sure exactly which one. But how many different cables we have going from the connector to the, the CPU. All right. So the more connectors you have, the quicker your speed is. So if we look at this um, 2.0 by 4, you get 4 gigabit. And if you double it, you go to 8, you get 8. If you double it again, you get 16. All right. So for a PCI Express 2.0 times one lane, every lane gets you 1 gigabit per second. All right. um, with 3, you can see that one lane gets you 2 gigabit. So we've doubled our speed from 2 to 3. Just something to think about when you're buying hardware, if you're putting a network card in something. What type of speeds am I going to possibly be able to get out of this? Um, and what type of speeds do I want to be able to connect? You can do crazy things like um, connect, um, you can load share Ethernet cables. So if you're like, OK, I've got a server that has a boatload of traffic going to it. My one gig connection is not quite enough. You could put a second Ethernet 
controller in it for another gigabit, and you could have two Ethernet cables going from the computer to your switch or to your router, and it, you could set it up to load share. So it would send half the data down one, half the data down two, so you've just doubled your internet, your network speed there. There are crazy things like that you could do, or you could do failover, so if one fails, it sends it out the other way, so that way your server never goes offline. All sorts of wonderful things. So now we've got our network interface card, right? And we need some way to identify the network interface. And that leads us to the wonderful world of Macs, all right? A Mac is a media access control address, all right? And if you go to your computer and you um, do a IP config space dash A, all right, it will tell you the physical address, and that would be your Mac, all right? So if we notice, we've got two different Macs here. All right, um, and they all should be different. Every Mac technically has its own unique ID, IP, uh, ID address. All right. Um, traditionally, this doesn't change. Now, why do I say traditionally? Anyone know? All right, because companies have gotten smart. Starbucks, for example. How does Starbucks know you're in their store? They don't, right? You could walk in the door, and Starbucks technically would have no way of knowing you're there unless a person sees you and recognizes you and writes down on a little piece of paper, Dylan showed up today. <laughs> all right? Now, some, some stores have loyalty cards, right? So it's like, oh, we'll give you 2% off if you get our loyalty card. And now they can track the bejesus out of you. Every time you showed up, they're like, oh, this person showed up again. They bought these things. We need to remember that. So... In the future, when there's a sale in toilet paper, we'll email them. They know. They buy a lot of toilet paper. Right. But what companies have started doing is they're saying, okay, to get on our internet, we need your MAC address from your device so we can now track your phone. So when you go into Starbucks and your phone connects to Starbucks Wi-Fi, they go, oh, this, you know, F322 showed up today. Every Wednesday, F322 shows up. All right, and they're now able to track you via that. Um, so people obviously started having a big huff and puff about this, right? Do you want to be tracked by your phone? Not really, all right? Now, I've got bad news for you guys. If you don't want to be tracked, there's only one option for you. Go live in a cave or an underground bunker. That is about your only option to not be tracked in the world. No cell phones allowed. You can have other technology, just no cell phones. Um, you live in a cave because every time you use your internet, you're, you're being tracked by somebody. <laughs> every time you walk in a building that has security cameras, technically you could be being tracked. All right, they could have facial recognition set up and go, "Yep, you're not allowed to come in here." All right, um, so yeah, just you know, kind of something to kind of keep your your eyes open for. I always love to play the game in buildings where are the security cameras. Just walk in and start looking for them. It's really interesting if you go into any sale anywhere that's selling things. Look at security cameras by the, at the cell, point of sales and what they're pointing at. Anyone know? Oh, well, yes, they're looking at you. They're actually more focused on the person checking you out. They want to make sure the person checking them out isn't stealing money from them. So, yes, they want to make sure that you're not stealing from them, but at the cash registers, they're more worried about the money. It kind of cracks me up that they don't trust them. I'm sure it is well-founded not to trust all their employees, but can't not trust one and trust another one. But like, no, we're going to turn the camera off on Greg today. We trust him. Brandon, no, we don't, we don't trust that guy. <laughs> All right. So something to think about. But anyway, some Mac addresses. Um, yeah, they are standard devices. All right. You can look up what specific device, um, not specific device, yeah, well, at least manufacturer of a device by a Mac address. Because Mac addresses... Um, companies are signed ranges. So like every Xbox out there has a MAC address of maybe like 10.fo.05. You know, like these three say that, oh, that's a Microsoft device. And your Samsung phone would be, you know, A1-23-B6. You go, okay, that's a Samsung phone. All right. Um, so every device manufacturer is, has been saying, okay, you get this block of MAC addresses. And how many different MAC addresses are there? Right here. 
So we've got you know, 1,000, million, billion, 281 trillion different MAC address op combinations out there. All right. So that is a lot of different uh, uh, possibilities up there. And this is six sets of two hexadecimal digits. All right. If you remember hexadecimal, and remember how many different combinations each spot has? Sixteen. All right. That's why you're seeing the le wonderful letters in here, right? Like this D or this A. All right. So remember, it's hexadecimal is zero to nine and A to F. There are sixteen different possible combinations for every one spot. All right. So we've got six sets of two. So we've got twelve hexadecimal numbers. So that would be 16th to the 12th power, if you were curious. The 12th power. That's how many different combinations. So that's 281,000, or trillion. All right. Now, once you send out your uh, MAC address, normally most devices will say, okay, here's, your, here's an IP address for you. Thanks for joining the network. Here's an IP address. All right. And at that point, for the most part, in my mind, MAC addresses kind of become irrelevant. All right. But MAC addresses are our first step into the wonderful world of networking. Now, I did say that um, historically they're unique to every device. All right. However, it is now possible to um, randomize your MAC address. All right. So you would say, hey, on this specific network, in this case, it's Batcave. All right. I want to use a pri I want to have a private IP a, a private address. So my MAC address is going to change. All right. Um, so this one is over here is iPhone. Over here on the left, this is Android. So here you can see you use the randomized MAC default. So we can at least have different MAC addresses. Now, I don't know if that's, I think that's specific to every time you hook onto the network. I am not positive of that one. Um, it could just be that every time on Awesome, you know, you're on Batcave, you connect with this MAC address. Every time you're on HTC here, you have a different MAC address. So at least from one building to the next building, you know, you could, can't track this. Um, but I'm not positive on that one. But anyway, so both Android and iPhone are now giving you this option for saying, nope, I don't want to be tracked as much. Let me randomize my address. And as you can see, at least on Android, it's the default. All right, so that's kind of nice to add instead. All right, um, maybe you don't want it to be randomized. All right, so like for an example at home with my home automation, I have my home automation set up to be able to I'm going, to call, I'm going to put this in air quotes, track my phone. All right, so my home automation every minute or two minutes pings my phone to see if it's there. If it's not there, it tells my home automation, Ray's right, not home. And if I'm not home and my wife isn't home, then it's going to actually turn all the lights in the house off. No, yeah, might as well save a little bit of electricity. All right, so that's what I have it set up to do. I also could set up to like stop any music playing or turn TVs off or, you know, whatever the case is, depending on how my, my network is set. Um, so I could just turn things off, but no one's home. Now that does, let's go a little problematic when you come to like nighttime, right? You're like, maybe I want some lights left on in the house. You have to set up some rules and whatnot for that. That becomes a whole other level of complexity. But um, for right now, just my wife and I both leave. All the lights in the house will just turn off that are on my home automation. That's not a lot of lights. Anything built into my house isn't on home automation, like, you know, built to the ceiling or whatnot. But I have a lot of outlets and things around the house. Um, so, like, for my home, I don't want a random MAC address. I want my phone to have the same MAC address every time I connect, so that way my home automation keeps working. So, it, it could become slightly problematic is what it comes down to. Right. Now, I have mentioned IP addresses. Right. So as I said, your MAC address is specific to that device. It, in theory, never really changes. Your IP address, on the other hand, that has the opportunity to change freaking a lot. All right. So up here on the screen, I have default. Um, I have a whole bunch of different things. I should. Let's start with IP addresses themselves. There are two different versions of IP addresses. There is a version four and version six. Here we have version four. Here we have version six. All right. For IP version four, there are 4.3 billion possible addresses. All right. That would be two to the 16th, no, two to the 32nd. That's two to the 32nd, all right? Um, an IP address is 
four 8-bit addresses. All right. IP version six is two. There, it's, it's still binary. Actually, this is going to get sexadecimal. Um, but there's 128 different bits. Anyway, it's two to the 128th. All right. So for that, there are 340 undecillion possible addresses. All right. Now, I did some quick math earlier today. Um, there are roughly 8 billion people in the, United, in the world, not United States, in the whole freaking world. With IP version 6, with four point, or no, 340 undecillion possible addresses, each person could have 42 times 10 to the 27th power ad IP addresses dedicated to them. That's a lot of addresses that each person would get. So I took the, yeah, 340 undecillion and I divided that by 8 billion. I think I did that right. That's a lot of different possible combinations that you could have just for you. Now, if I think about this, and I have, if you look at IP version 4, and there's 4.3 billion possible combinations, and there's 8 billion people, that means every two people gets one IP address. You might go, yeah, okay, that's fair. My kids don't need IP addresses. And while yes, that is true, as an individual, when you start getting to corporations, we need more addresses, right? My personal, like if I, my personal IP address, I am not going to dedicate to an Amazon server because then I would have no IP address. So we do need more, possibly, than the number of people that live in the world that we have. So IP version 4 is starting to become congested in the world of, we start getting into the real world. Obviously in your own household. How many devices do you guys think you have on your network? I'm going to give you guys a, a minute or two to think about that. Try to come up with a number of Ethernet devices you have on your network. All right, so... After quick poll, basically less than 10 devices is what you all have. Maybe less than 15 would probably, probably cover you all. all right? um, I'm approaching 30 to 40. Well, again, when I start going to my home automation, I'm like, um, I have Google Homes in throughout most of my house. I have, and yeah, I know, listening to me, probably not the best plan, but um, that's what I do. I've got one in the kitchen family room area. I've got one in the playroom. I've got one in each bedroom for ocean sounds and whatnot. And the, one of the big reasons we have them all over the house is from automation control. I can say, hey, Google, turn this on or turn that on, and it will think and then go, turning that on, and it'll just turn lights on for me. So it's very convenient for me to be able to do that. So, like, I got Google Homes. I've got home automation devices. I've got my server, my desktop. You know, my printer is all on Wi-Fi. My Wii is on my Wi-Fi. I have the original Wii store once in a while. I can't wait to introduce my daughter to that. That's gonna be fun. Um, but... We, um, laptops, phones, tablets, Kindles, you know, those types of things. All of a sudden you're like, there's a lot more devices probably than you think in your house. But if I said, you need a hundred, I'm going to give you a hundred IP addresses for your house. You're going to go, that's plenty of devices. All right. Um, if you actually look at my house, my server actually takes up a lot more IP addresses. I counted it as one, but my main server, I subdivide into a whole bunch of containers, which each has their own IP address. Um, so I probably have 10 IP addresses or more dedicated just to my server. <laughs> um, and, and I did that for purposes of simplicity of managing it. You think having a lot of IP addresses would make it more complicated, but it actually makes it simpler because when one thing goes wrong, it's one thing. It's not everything on the system that I have to fight with. It. Oh, this little portion of my server crashed. Restart that one little portion. And it's just one IP address. So yes, I have to know which one's which, but after that, it's second. Um, so yeah, so I, I've got a lot of different um, IP addresses going on in my house. So I need a whole lot. But for most homes, all right, you are going to fall into a class C IP range. Uh, back. Um, so you're going to be a class C IP. And I'd say most routers are going to have this be their default um, IP address. So it's going to be 192.168. And then this one here, this X, all right, that's going to probably, if for default, going to be a 0, 1, or a 2. Most likely a 0 or a 1. That just seems to be where they fall. All right. And then the Y at the end here, this is the specific to every device. So every device on your network will have a different Y. All right. So let's say you said, okay, my home address is 192.168.52.1. That's my router. 
And then when I go from my router to connect to my, my phone, that's 52.36. And when I connect to my computer, it's 48 in those sets of things, right? Um, so every device is gonna have its own specific different one, all right? Um, but so most are gonna fall in there. Now, if you're using Comcast, some odd reason Comcast thinks that you they need more IP addresses. So on their modem router combination units, they actually use 10.0.0.x. All right, so they actually go to a different um, IP address default range. Can you use that? Yes, you could use that if you would want to, all right? The key here is um, there are specific IP ranges that are dedic dedicated for private residents, well, for small businesses and like that, all right? And you may be going, why? All right. Well, the reason why is if you're using the same IP address as something that's on the worldwide internet, when you say, you know, if say, say your your phone, your house, you set up to 8.8.8.blank, .8 right? All well and good. Um, but you're like, okay, let me go out to the internet or let me go to, you know, Google, Google's DNS server. Well, that's 8.8.8.8. .8 and if on your home network, give your computer 8.8.8.8. .8 .8 .8 .8 .8 .8 .8 your router is going to shoot any traffic that's going to Google's DNS to the other computer. And it's coming back to you and you're like, what the hell? There's nothing there. <laughs> I got no response. You don't have internet now. All right. So you have to make sure that we are being careful when you're picking these. So there are certain things that you do need to take into it. Um, but anyway, so class C is where most of us, our small businesses and things like that are going to be, especially your home network. Again, it might be a good idea to change from 192.168.1. something to 52 or 100 or whatever the case is. Change that up just a little bit so that way if someone tries to go on your network and you have DHCP disabled and they're like, okay, most likely it's going to be this, they go to 192.168.8.0 and they're like, I don't have internet. And they're like, okay, what about one? Now they're like, am I going to try this 255 different times? Yes. I have had Um, I doubt that the X here is changing daily. Yeah. So the Y does change. Um, and so this comes down to how your router works. Right? Most routers, they say, okay, we're going to when, we're give, when we have what's called DHCP, um, which is your dynamic host communication protocol, I believe. It, it's what assigns the IP addresses. So when your phone connects to your network and it's like, hey, I need IP, it goes, DHCP goes, hey, here you go, and it gives you one, all right? Most of them will just start at, and normally it's a range of uh, 100 is where we start. Not all of them, but by default, that seems to be where they like to start. Um, that reserves the first 100 for you to put, make static and other things. Um, but anyway, it starts at 100, and then, so when my phone connects, it goes, hey, you get 100. And when your phone connects, it gets, hey, you get 101. And when your phone connects, hey, you get 102. And no, you've got, so you've given out the first 110. You know, you've given out 100, 110. And then my phone just connects. And then you turn your laptop on. It's like, hey, 100's now empty. Here you go. So it gives your computer 100. All right. So sometimes they just say, we're just going to sequentially give out numbers. All right. So it's always 100 to 110, 115, whatever that gets used. Does that really matter? No, right? Some routers will do it based on your MAC address. And they go, okay, your MAC is this, we're gonna give you 100.12. His MAC is this, he gets 116. So every time you do come back, if you have the same MAC address, you get the same IP address, right? Um, is it set that way? No, there's nothing that specifically says that you owe, only your MAC address will get this. However, you can set up static IP addresses. So you can set, tell your DHCP CPR server, but hey, if you see this MAC address, Give it this IP address. So that way things are consistent. And for like my, at home again, my servers are that way. Um, you can, and you have two options. You can set static IP addresses on your router itself. So your router is the one that's actually doing the brain thinking. Your phone goes, hey, DHCP, give me an IP. It goes, oh, you got this Mac? Here's your 100, All right? Um, or you could set your phone up so it's like, hey, every time I connect to this Wi-Fi, give me an address of 100. You have to be careful though, if your DHCP, PC server can give out the IP address of 100. Because if something else is already in the network with 100 and your phone connects and says, hey, I'm 100, now you've got two devices conflicting with the same IP address. And that can cause problems. Um, but again, that's why typically they start at 100. So if you want your phone to be static and you're going to set it on your phone itself, 
which technically is the better system because your phone always will have it that way. Um, there won't be any screw ups. You would set it below 100. You'd be like, okay, I'm going to start. I'm going to start my static IP addresses that I'm going to sign from devices at 50. Okay, 50 is is my phone. 51 would be your phone if I'd set static. All right, so that way DHCP doesn't even have that option in that range. By setting on the router, it doesn't matter what IP you give it because your router will save that specific IP address. For opening ports, that might make you like really bad at stuff. All right. Um, for me, I originally had all my stuff being DHCP, and I realized how big of a pain that but that became, and I didn't want to re-remember different IP addresses for things. So, like my home automation is dot one one one, I believe it is. So I changed my range from from being one hundred to two fifty five to one hundred and fifty to two hundred and fifty five. So I now only have a hundred DHCP range. Well, that's a hundred on my main network. I like all my home automation devices are on a different VLAN, so they're actually on a different network. <laughs> So I have, they're all their own different. So I'm not going to ever hit my, my limits on these. So I'm not worried by, inc you know, increasing that to one. It's not going to be a problem. Uh, but I just now know that all my server stuff is between 100 and 150. Um, and those are set on the actual machines, not on the route. So yeah. Um, anyway, any other questions? That's an excellent point about random, getting random IP addresses. All right, um, so anyway, different class ranges, and these different ranges have different um, um, sizes of networks that they are, is really what it comes down to. And that we can talk more about in this one. So here, there we go, we have an IP address subnetting. What is a subnet? All right, and the best way I have to explain this to you guys is subnets are like what street you live on, and the device ID is what house number. All right, so in this, in this case, I have slash 24, and that is telling me my subnet, All right? That subnet is the equivalent of 255.255.255.0. And if we would actually write this out in binary, 255 is eight ones. So it's eight ones dot eight ones dot eight ones. Hopefully you all can do that math real quick. Eight plus eight plus eight equals a four, hence the slash 24, All right? So what that's telling me with this slash 24 here is that's telling me the first 24 bits of the IP address, which I have written out here in binary, all right, the first 24 are my network. So from here all the way over to here, that's all network. And the last eight I'm saving for the specific device. It's really convenient when you're setting up anything with networking, you set it up that the Network portion is on a period. It just makes your life easier. Do you have to do it that way? No, you do not have to do it that way at all. All right, you could say, oh, I'm only gonna do 23, but should make this last one instead of 255, make it 254, all right? So now, instead of having, um, you know, let's, let's do this again. Oh, go back, there we go. And so this would be 23. That would make this one uh, 254 if it was written out. So now from here over would be your network, and these nine now would be your um, your device ID. All right. So you can do crazy things like that. All right. Does it make a lot of sense? Oh yeah. All right. Because by adding one digit here, right, we had 255 different possible combinations. By adding one digit, or, sorry, 256. We have to count zero. By adding one digit, we now doubled that. So we now have 512 different devices that can be on our network, All right? So if you're a small business and you have boatloads of security cameras and things, and you just want everything on one network to make your IT life really easy, you're like, man, I got 300 devices. Well, now you need to have two different networks or have a bigger network, all right? So you could maybe make this instead of, you know, you could just do 23 and that would cover you. Personally, I'd say screw the 23, and I would say just make it 16 and 16, and that will give you a stupid number of, of, of things that could be on your main network, and everything would be perfectly fine. All right. Um, so that is IP addressing or subnetting. And the whole point of subnetting is to allow the take the network and split it into a whole bunch of different smaller networks. All right. Because if we didn't have subnetting, every device on your home network would be in the World Wide Web. And we'd be out of IP version four. 
right? But by allowing us to subnet it, it actually allows us to have multiple, it actually increases our pool size. Because all of us all have routers at our house. We can all use for our home network, our home subnet, 192.168.0.0 or 0. blank. We can all use it. So instead of us all having to have our own specific network addresses at home, we're all now sharing this whole group and it allows us to actually increase the size of the actual network. Now, you all also at home have a public IP address. Right? Um, if you go to a lovely website, it's called, what is my IP? It will show you, there you go, that my public IP address is 167.102.238.141. That is HCC's public IP address. So instead of me going to hagerstowncc.edu, technically I could go to this address and, every, and they still bring up their website. Now, depending on how they have things set up with proxies and things like that, it may block me because it's like, no, 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 you didn't come at me the right way. <laughs> You tried to bypass something, and I don't like that. Um, we, can, we can find out. No, it doesn't look like it's going to work. Technically, that should work. In actuality, it doesn't look like it. So, that's fine. But anyway, so you all have a, a public IP address. So do I, right? Um, so yeah, kind of an, an interesting way to just look at that. It's like, okay, we all have a public IP address. That then goes, you know, given to us by our ISP. Our ISP has been given, hey, here are your IP version four addresses you can give out. These are what you give to every, anybody on your network. And then we all take those and we submit those into smaller little networks. That way it again, kind of increases our network. Nice. All right, that is where we're going to end today's presentation.